lecture. I apologize, this lecture will be more calculation intensive than the one in the morning. I really wish that it's the other way around, but that will violate causality, which is bad. I think in giving lecture and you randomly switch to lectures, it's probably not going to be good. So I promised we will quantize the Dirac field today, but I want to tie some loose end. It's related to your question about the cube. We'll, we'll spend, uh, yeah, at some point and then we'll realize, yes, that the conserve the current gave us a charge and it has a cube and this cube is indeed should be the one in show up in the Lagrange. Okay, but the first loose end, basically we have been discussing this well in the Mariana Fermia and the interview question I really want to ask and literally, this is, I'm going to post it in the weekend, is that one of the questions would be, draw me a big table and compare Dirac well and Mariana Fermia. So now I have the last piece of information about them to give it to you. Is that remember what we have Okay, I guess I don't know how to write it without using this Q to covariant the derivative thing. So that's that. This is our new Dirac equation for the Dirac fermion given some electric magnetic field. Right? And now I want to have to ask the question is remember this C conjugation? It makes a real spinner, which is nice. But let's see if there's anything more we can say about it. Actually, we have already done this once. What we showed is that the C, this satisfy the same Dirac free, free Dirac equation. That's why we can equal them. Now we will emphasize why the free part is, needs to be emphasized. So we'll do the same, exactly same step. So if last time I did it too fast, we'll, we'll, we'll see it again. So we just need to star everything. So this become minus i, gamma mu become star, partial mu when there's another i. Whenever I see an i, I change it to minus i, and that's all I need to do. And then, I don't expect at all you remember this, is that in this, in order for this C spinner, the, the, the C conjugated spinner has some nice property it desired. The C matrix has to satisfy this interesting. It needs to relate to the gamma matrices and the gamma star matrices somehow, and that's the relationship. So I'm just going to stick it there. So the minus sign is pure. I have I, C inverse gamma mu, C, partial nu, and the rest doesn't change. Okay, I'll just be cute and write M as MC minus C inverse C. And now we'll do the same trick. We'll get a 1C over here and the 1C inverse over here. So you get C inverse minus, wait, plus. I gamma mu and partial mu minus I Q A mu minus M C plus I star and this is exactly what's defined called the C conjugate. Okay, now we want to compare this equation with this equation which we started with. As we have already shown, this C conjugate satisfy the free Dirac equation. Just that part has never changed. It doesn't matter if you have additional term in your equation of motion, but the crucial part is this minus sign, which means the Psi spinner, if it couples to the electric magnetic field, with charge Q, the C conjugate will couple it with a minus Q. Mm -hmm. So this is what people call the charge conjugate. So this C matrix is actually called the charge conjugate. Well, this whole thing, I guess, is called the charge conjugation. It's also a 
discrete symmetry and then you can see why the, uh, the meronum fermion cannot carry any gauge charge because it literally is asking this guy who has minus q charge to equals to the other guy has a q charge minus q equals q the only thing that it's going to work is q equals zero so this derivation shows us has to be neutral in interaction. And this also shows you the C charge conjugate of a spinner has the opposite charge of the spinner. OK, now we close all the ties. And we're going to quantize things. Oh, this is exciting. And we spend like 3.1 lectures. Finally, we get there here. Yay! OK, do you still remember the many steps to quantize a theory? That the dance as a step, like there's some steps. Okay, I'll say this slowly. He likes to give recipes, but uh, he doesn't cook them. <laughs> 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 but but <laughs> go to his lectures, they all have like, really nice recipes that I have step one, two, three, four, which is good. I'll also follow his recipe. Until you know we have a disaster, then we come. But let's try. So the step one is really nice. It says, take a good Lagrangian, like Lorenz scalar, basically. Well, we spent three lectures doing that, or two at least. So it says, we have a good Lagrangian. We're good to go. Step two. Now, well, step two, you guys did it. It says, pick a Conjugate the momentum. And then calculate the Hamiltonian. A priori, I don't know why I need to calculate the Hamiltonian, but after that, it seems to be important to do. And then he says step three. Now you have field and the momentum. It's like you have X and P. So now we know how to quantize things. We just make X and P not a commute. So now we say there is a commutator relationship on field and its momentum. <coughs> and in a way, you promote some operators. Some coefficients into operators. Okay, this is where we're going to do it a slightly differently. And then the last step is he realized he has some infinity and then decided to sweep under his carpet. <laughs> he says, We're just going to impose something called the normal order. And the infinity goes under the carpet and a happy ending. That uh, will do the same. We're going to also sweep some of this under car magical carpet. Well, I mean, you have two to two, you actually study about how exactly sweep, how, how to exactly extract things out of infinity, as you are fond of the. The Casimir effect. Apparently, that uh, there, there, there are things you can extract out of the infinity that are actually meaning. Okay, so we'll do exactly this. Yeah, you sort of have 
an idea how it goes in the scalar case. Now we're just going to change the sign to Psi. And hopefully nothing changed. Well, then I, wish I, then I don't need to stand here. OK, let's pick a good Lagrange. To, to be, to be, let's, let's, let's start with the free theory. We're going to spend uh, at least the three lectures on, no, two lectures in interactions. But let, let's study the free theory first. So oh, I pick my Lagrangian. Oh, well, a quarter we done, right? This is nice. Step two. Well, step two, you guys all did this. I think I count the number of people who submit homework and skip a few. But I think all you have shown that the counting of momentum is this, and the Hamiltonian density is given by something like this. You don't need to remember it. Okay, yay! <laughs> Step three. <laughs> By this speed, it will quantize the theory in two minutes at the most. But in step three, somehow we decide to be cautious. And you, you guys have done the cautious step, which is to integrate this Hamiltonian density against some solutions. OK, when I need to use a solution now, I'll write it down. But uh, by, my, by my spot check, you guys all find out that the answer looks like V star P, V, P minus C, P. C star, right? I think some of you find it like this morning, right before the lecture. So I hope you still remember this, yeah? And then I ask, what's the problem? Well, let's just assume we don't have a problem, carry on. Oh, I will just impose. OK, try to impose. I'll try to impose C. Oh, let's, let's first promote them. I'm sorry to use the eraser, but to copy this line down is too silly. About the promotion is just we decide to label this operator by the momentum and then change the star into dagger. Okay, now it become operators. We've done the promotion, and we just need to impose this thing. And uh, we have our very funny normalization. OK, let me impose this. And now I'll happily reuse this relationship to write this thing in terms of something I know how to do, which is I subtract this guy and I add this guy back. <coughs> And then write down the first thing as the commutator, and this thing is something I want. OK, now let's just stick it there. It says that Hamiltonian is equal to some integral the energy of some individual particle. The first thing didn't change at all. And the next thing become minus this commutator, which 
is delta zero. Huh? Oops. So this thing contributes to infinity. And then there is this thing. Yeah? Some of you have done the homework. The last part has already speculated this far or even further. But now is the time that we realize there's a problem. First, there's infinity. We're going to sweep infinity under the carpet. So let's not worry about infinity yet. The problem is this thing. This thing is saying, seems we run into the same problem as Dirac. It says, if you make more C particles, ah, the energy would just drop lower. Then we have an unbounded, we have Hamiltonian unbounded from below, which is never a good thing. Okay, so this one is the one I want to make. See, the, the, all the problematic things, then I can't reach it. I'm not tall enough. Okay, so all the problematic thing comes from this minus sign. So let's trace where it comes from. This minus sign is coming from that plus sign. Because of the plus sign, get a plus here, here, give me a minus sign. And that plus sign, we can continue tracing it, and it comes from this plus sign. Yeah? Sign tracking. If we have made the minus sign error, this is exactly what we need to do. And we realize, okay, there's no error made. I just want to flip this sign. Okay? So let's flip it. In the sense that we want to change this sign, and then the rest will be good. So the propose is this plus sign needs to be a minus. Well, by con conservation of zero, this sign had better be a plus. It seems that what is, needs to be proposed is that we want an anti commutator. If we want to make any sense of this theory, we'd better have anti-commutator instead of the commutator. So here's our conclusion, is that at step, step three, we question our recipe. It says, no, this doesn't work. I tried to impose commutator. But, but uh, it gave me some energy that is bonded from, unbonded from below. And I realized if I impose anti-commutator, everything would be fine. But what does anti-commutator mean? So here's the time that we figure out what anti-commutator mean. I'll propose the pro following problem. Since that... Uh, Forget about the, the field theory. The field theory says, very pretty picture. OK, I'll produce a, propose a quantum mechanics problem. It's like the quantum harmonic oscillator that you know so well, except that everything is an anti commutator So this is an anti commutator and then this is an anti commutator then this is another anti And then here is the following question. So the question is, I propose this thing called A dagger A. And the question is, what are the eigenvalue of this? And then, I wonder what's a dagger A commutator with A and what's a dagger A commutator with a dagger. Okay. 
So this is a problem proposed, uh, and then you have three minutes to do it. And as in Euro, you are doing problems, talk to each other, hopping around the room, and I'll erase the rest of the board. So you have the time exactly equal to me erasing six boards. <laughs> in case you wonder how to find these eigenvalues, a hint would be try to say what happens if you, if you square it. So what's IE dagger 8's eigenvalue? Zero and one. Interesting. What's the A dagger commutator with A? Minus A. Minus A. What about this one? Excellent. Okay. So, because A, okay, so A dagger A seems to have eigenvalue, which means it's good. I can label states. So there are two states in the system. Then we'll label it as this number operator says it could either have zero number of things. I guess this will be my one particle state or one whatever state. It must be proportional to one. And by my Anti-commutator, we act again, it just gives zero. So we have a system. Can have at most one thing occupying a state. And there is a very famous guy that is named after this kind of system called the Pauli exclusions principle. You try to put another thing in, not possible. And we know Pauli exclusion principle applies to fermions. So we realize if we have an anti-commutator relationship, it means that the Dirac field that we studied is actually fermions. Yay! This is, this is really a crazy moment. On the first lecture, we showed a heuristically about this rotating 2 pi pick up a minus sign thing, that the Dirac field is a spin one half. And today we showed it is fermion. If it's not a fermion, that energy is going to give me a problem. So basically we see a very explicit example of a spin statistic theorem. Well, it's very specific. We wrote down a Lagrangian, and we studied that it is a spin one half fermion. And tomorrow morning, I promise we will have a rigorous proof this thing actually has spin one half. After today, we write down a one particle state. And we'll show that a one particle state, like the state contains an electron in it, is indeed have spin one half. And this is a very remarkable theorem. And you can read, I think, there's Pauli's original paper quoted in the lecture notes. What the Pauli did is that basically he says, if I assume that energy needs to be positive, then fermion cannot have commutator. It has to have anti-commutator. The, the things that, uh, and then, then he showed if, the, if you want to respect micro, Causality, then integer spin things, which are bosons, can only have a commutator really. So, but that, there is that. But let's come back from the quantum mechanics and look at our Hamiltonian, which is almost good to go. Uh, oh, I'll mention this. Nobody requests me to do it, which is good. I don't want to do it. So remember the first step. The step three is actually impose commutator relationship on the field and its momentum, and then realize 
the creation and annihilation operator satisfy commutator relationship. And now we're just doing it a reversely. And I'll just write down without showing that actually Psi, Psi dagger, which is the momentum, okay, I'll write the I, will satisfy, of course, they need to have some space dependence. And then the rest vanish. Okay, I'm happy to show that to the rest vanish. And the, the, the others are left as a exercise with gamma matrices. Well, this, this is actually easier than the Hamiltonian effect. So, so if you plug in the mode expansion here, now equipped it by the anti commutator of Bs and the Cs, I hope it was clear, but I should uh, make it clear that the rest uh, vanish if I write it out. But I thought that uh, you have seen this many times. Let me write it clear. So there is this guy equals coming with the funny normalization. And then same for C, and then all others vanish. Yeah. So uh, you, I think you have shown it for scalar case that these two sets of imposing commutators for scalars are equivalent. Now I'm just saying it's also equivalent for fermions and without trying to do that on. I don't think it's very enlightening to watch me do that. Hmm. You never know. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, where are we? We're at a step three. Yeah, step four. Step four, we have that guy. B, dagger B, minus C, C, dagger. So normal ordering, we still want this H normal ordered is basically the thing that it has b dagger b plus c dagger c. Yeah. So basically we want, says, first we don't want you to use any anti-commutator relationship because that will just get some infinity. And then we say, we want to put an annihilation operator to the right as a U rule, except that that's not good enough. So now we have a fermion rule it says that the normal order of some fermions, you want to put the C's to the right, but when doing so, if you happen to swap some fermions, you'll pick up some minus signs. And now you can take the normal ordering off. So now normal ordering takes two steps. First, to make sure all the annihilation operator goes to the right. But whenever you pass through some, you switch to some fermions, they pick up a minus sign. Fermions anti-commute is what people do. And that's how it applies to this normal order. So now we finished quantize our Dirac field. I have only one final remark. 
regarding the infinity that we swept uh, under the carpet. Okay, let's go through again. Oh, okay, first two steps, we didn't do nothing. Okay. So for fermion field, we need to impose anti-commutator relationship and uh, whenever we want to normal order some operator, we want all the annihilation operator goes to the right. And if you switch any fermions in the process, we pick up on the minus. So that's what we have done in the last half. So the final remark is, remember I was tra keep tracking all those minus signs? This, this never de do anything about this infinity. Negative infinity is still infinity. No, this is brilliant. So there is this, this person that has this such an awesome idea. So the, remember the scalar field contributes a plus infinity, and it seems the fermion fields contribute to minus infinity. So if you add them all up, <laughs> they just disappear. And in order to ensure that, so the, the proposal is not that you grab a boson, say Higgs boson, you grab a fermion electron says, do your infinite cancel. They probably don't because they have very different fields. So the proposal is for each particle we have, it has a partner, somehow known as the super partner. And this super partner and the original particle in every way you can think of are exactly the same, except one of them is boson and one of them is fermion. Since you demand all the other properties to be exactly the same, then when you do this calculation of infinity, then you can envision, because all the other properties are the same, they will actually cancel. So this is known as a supersymmetry. And supersymmetry has proposed, I don't know if you heard about this, the most embarrassed moment of the theorists of calculating the vacuum energy to the cosmology constant, and we are off by 10 to the 120, order of magnitude. And supersymmetry says, ah, I solved that problem because in my construction, the vacuum energy is always zero. And you know, because we did observe that the tiny bit, which means we, did, we are not living in a supersymmetric world, which is a good thing. You can show in many ways that if we live in a SUSE vacuum, a lot of things like ourselves wouldn't afford. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, the problem, the only problem with this beautiful, beautiful theory is that we haven't discovered any supersymmetric particle. But supersymmetry is still a very successful theory. I mean, 50% of the particle has been discovered. <laughs> <laughs> So what shall we do now? So we have quantized our theory. And uh, oh, yes. Now we have creation operator, annihilation operator. It seems the next thing to do is to find a vacuum and then make some one particle states. Seems logical. Logical moment. Logical move is to talk about the states. OK. As you roll, we will find a vacuum, then demand all the annihilation operator will annihilate. And uh, all the create, all the other annihilation operator also annihilate. This is our vacuum. And we can even say, let's make a true server vacuum to be nicely normalized. And the best part of this Vacuum is, after that much trouble, the vacuum finally have zero energy because all the annihilation operator has been swept to the right. All right, step zero, vacuum, done. Next step, one particle state. Well, this is not too much worse, I grab a creation operator of a type B, it always comes with these spin labels that it's 
like either one or two. And then I can just label my state by the momentum, but now I have also have to label it by this spin label. So this will be our one particle state. And uh, similarly, you can define the F, the C particle, the same, but then they look exactly the same. So you just draw some bar or whatever, do, do something like put a C there. Just make sure that they don't look exactly the same. But they are the one particle state. And it probably wouldn't surprise you if I ask what's the normalization of this one particle state. It totally this normalization inherited from the commutators. Yeah, because you have one from one from the right, one from the left, and then you move, and then you get it. So this is, shouldn't surprise you. And now, the thing we can ask, now that we have a one particle state, the question, we're gonna ask two questions, yes? Is there a delta or s as well? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, they should be, they should be also normal in many ways. So now we're just going to ask questions such as what's the energy of this state? Yeah? So it seems we need to do H acting on this dagger acting on vacuum. It turns out a trick called a calculate the commutator of this thing is always useful. But I'll just be very sneaky and I use the result you guys calculate. If you look at the Hamiltonian, it basically looks like this multiplied by energy. So I'm just, I'm just trying to calculate this. And I decided since you all, you all calculate them, then I don't have to calculate. I'm just gonna write down the result, which is this. Because if you compare our Hamiltonian with that thing, the only difference is I have a factor of energy there. So. Okay, now I can con continue to compute this, says this equals to, the commutator plus to switch them or whatever, I have another term, but the other term is Hamiltonian acting on vacuum, which is zero, which means this will just be equals to EP. And this is the one particle state I define. So this is really good. This is really consistent to check. I said I created a particle of momentum P, and I asked, what's your energy? Well, your energy had better to be the energy related to that momentum. Okay. Question? Um, I just have a question about your anti-commutation relations on psi over here. Um, are we still thinking of psi as being a spinner with like four components? Excellent question. I'm being very sneaky. They should all have this. Yes, they are for component spinner, and I can't do that a commutator if they are considered to be that. You should consider a component by component. Excellent question. Yeah, but now you know that if I keep track of all indices, that uh, I just can't. <laughs> so whenever a question arises, we'll make sure our indices are right. Which is right now, actually. Right now is the time that I have to do a computation to keep track of indices. Which I'm so fond of. Okay. We'll need to take a, a later break. Because this is a continued thing that we can ask about one particle state. So after this computation, we can take a break. 
remember. The question is, I want to ask, is the this is what everybody does. They have a contact complex field, they quantize it, and they claim there are two types, and then they claim one is particle, one is an antiparticle. And the why? <laughs> like, uh, how do I, why should I believe you B particle and the C particle are antiparticles of each other? So now we decide to provide some proof. In order to provide the proof, so we, what we want to do is, what we know about the particle and the, and the particle is that they have equal and opposite charge. So we decide to measure their charge. Okay, so now we need to recall, now we have to make them interact with the electromagnet. Oh, it's right above me. Hi. But I actually don't really need to write it down. Okay, let's see if I can survive without writing it down. So this is the QED lagrange. So what we claim is that this lagrange actually has this gauge symmetry, which is this thing, and it says this lagrange is invariant. So now we're gonna find the global subgroup of this. It sounds fancy, but it just literally means erase the dependence on x. This is a constant again. Well, as you can imagine, if this thing is a symmetry, then if it's a constant, of course it's a symmetry. So now I can calculate the Noether current again. But I don't want to repeat all the process. I just wanted to point it out. The only difference that what I'm doing right now compared to what I'm doing without the coupling to the electromagnetic field is that there is a Q pop up. Because before there's no Q on the exponent, now there's a Q. And literally, that's the only difference. So if the, before the current, is written as psi bar gamma mu psi. The new current is written as Q psi bar gamma mu psi. Yeah, so far so good. Now I want to find what's the conserved the charge defined as the zeroth momentum integral. So this d3x, then it's psi bar gamma zero psi. No. Yes, but the, the bar and the gamma zero cancel. You get a psi dagger. Psi. Now I have to calculate that. Well, this is probably a good time to clarify the all sorts of index. So let's say spinner psi a, so a component is written as d3, no, depends on x, which is written as dvp. And we have a annihilation operator carry a spin label. And we have a U thing, which is our solution, which does carry the spinner label and the spin label. And then we have C dagger B A S P Okay, so 
that will be the mode expansion if I have kept all the lists. Yep. Uh, psi A of three vector X and psi A of four vector X? Good question. We'll come back to that uh, in the second half because that's what you mentioned. The other thing is the Heisenberg. And now we're in the Schrodinger. That doesn't, is the time independent. I'm not calculating conserving quantity, so I'm just being, try to be easy on myself. And, uh, Vary about, two. but we have to vary about the time, which is very important. So very importantly, we do have to consider when the psi does depend on time, what happens. But for now, I can vary about later. So let's write down Dagger. So in this case, he'll be on the same. This is the same. And uh, I'll be like normally what uh, you would see is that uh, the spin labels and the spinner labels they even have close enough. All the labels introduced by studying a fermion have been secretly erased. Okay, there's nothing fancy. I'm just taking dagger of everything. And then go back to my sloppy way of admitting all the labels. Because I, I can't keep track of that many. Yeah? It's the next, the line below looks like the line above. Three. Now I'm going to make use of the fact that you guys all did the homework. This is so awesome. No, I'm serious. Look, I don't want to multiply these two things together. <laughs> you're, you're like, we don't want to do it either. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> but I've already done it once in my life. I promise. Okay, so this thing, you have this integral and that integral and that integral. Let's see how the integrals. But the point is, there is the V dagger Q and the B P. And then there is some U dagger Q U. And then there is some E to the I X I T minus Q. And then the last term is CQ, CQ, CP dagger, and a V. Did I forgot the V? V dagger Q, VP, and then there is E to the I, X, I, P, Q. Okay? Now there are two terms. Two other terms, but the two, uh, two other terms has U, V, and U, V. And you probably have done the calculation before, so you know they have the orthogonal relationship, so they but just trust me that they will. And this is also something we have done. So if we just look at what's going on here, my, but it doesn't matter. The point is, the x integral is basically going to set p and q equal. Then you have the u dagger u from the, uh, the relationship that's just going to give you 2e, right? Do you still remember doing the homework? u dagger u and the v dagger v just give you 2e, yeah? And this, when you integrate around x, 
it produced a 2 pi to the cube. So there's a 2 pi to the cube, there's a 2e, they cancel one of that funny factor. That's why I never write down the funny factor. They all cancel. <laughs> See, this disappeared. The only thing this accomplished is cancel some funny factor set p equals q. After p is equal q, you get some 2e cancel some other funny factor. So that's after doing two integrals. We do x integral to enforce the momentum to be have the momentum dirt function, and then you do another momentum integral. So I can just write down the result because you have done similar calculation to be. Now we are left with one integral to do and some really cute things. This. Yeah? Now remember we want to normal order it. Then we get a minus sign. It says this conserved quantity which we call it a charge, receive contribution from the B particle to be Q, but the C particle will contribute minus Q. So the key, the key part of this definition is the normal ordering will turn this thing there's a Q here coming from the Nerder current. And then this particles, the B particle would be fine. But then this guy, when we normal order it, pick up a minus sign coming from normal order. So this says the particle and the antiparticles contribute to the charge in opposite the sign. It makes sense to call them particles and antiparticles. All right, so here we can take a break. Then we can come back for a causality. Two hours from now, I realized the, the free fermion might violate the causality. That's why now we are studying the causality to make sure that uh, we don't end up with that horrible fate. So, causality. Okay, before we get into the causality things, that uh, as it's asked, a very good question, that uh, why my field doesn't depend on time. That it would be bad, like causality, want to study some things like a different space time, and if my field doesn't even Evolve if it's a Schrodinger picture, it doesn't really help. So, but I'll be very sneaky. So remember that you have learned in the scalar field that the operator evolve in a certain way. Then you try to like use the very fancy BCH formula to actually study how the annihilation operator and the creation operator evolve. And then I pick up some e to the i e p t term. Then I get to get it absorbed here. So I'm just going to be very sneaky and then write down the field, the Heisenberg picture field. It's very important, but I, but I don't really want to do the derivation again. I'll just write down that. And then after that, uh, e to the i whatever thing get it absorbed this. Operator is actually the same operator we have been using. It's the free one. Okay, so the only difference is the PIXI is upgraded to P. And then we successfully incorporate the time dependence of our view. So in the first half of the course that um, you learned from Dan 
that a causality means that if I have two operator that is observable, they must commute. Yeah? And I think you have either like a homework or a tutorial or something that you guys calculate the phi at x and the phi at y indeed a commute when the separation is space-like. So causality says that if you are outside somebody's light cone, you shouldn't be able to influence them. And translate it into this commutator <laughs> language is that uh, things commute at a space-like separated point. Well, it probably has something to do that, it, that with the fact that you impose a commutator relationship. And now we are actually in trouble because this thing, or dagger, or bar, or whatever, some of these is not zero. So fermion, you, if you take a two fermion field and ask, does the commutator vanish? outside the light cone, it doesn't. But it's okay. <laughs> Everything is okay. Because we haven't created an, an experiment, uh, a parapros, the thing, the equipment, such that if you rotate the equipment by two pi, it pick up a minus i. We never, we've never seen that. So the, which means this fermion field, it's not observable, at least up until now. Nobody has ever observed it. If it's not observable, who cares if it, it commutes or anti commutes or do whatever. Whatever crazy things explode on the white, right? We, we, we couldn't care less. But we do care about observables. So the causality is really saying I have observable one and observable two, and we want this. Commute at a space like point. And I just spend a very long time to persuade you that anything that is a good fermion, like a real in terms, always look like something like a precise bar. And with something random in the middle, could be one gamma matrices, two gamma matrices with gamma five or whatever. It's a bilinear fermion. So although one fermion field is not observable, a bilinear is. So this is one time I'll be very careful with this spinner index because with this, so this could be completely a different observable, different place. And we want this to equals zero against space like seven. So this is what we want. And this has to be true because they are actually observable. And the idea of keeping the space index is really I want to be able to move things around now that uh, they are in. They don't have any secret index, I can just pull them out. And it says, well, the thing I impose the, for, for this theory had a better any possible <coughs> observable I can think of, all have this property. It's not like for one observable you have a causality, when some, for some other observable you don't have. No, for all observable, they all have to work which means we want this guy to be true at all time. Well, not, not at all space-like separation. Yeah? Okay, so what is that supposed to mean? The, the following thing is called a scene gun doing commutator and anti-commutator relationship and hopefully she doesn't grow. So what I wanted to do study is I have four objects and it's arranged this way and I wonder what's the commutator, right? 
I'll just eventually substitute the correct spinner in it, but the A, B, C, D, I don't know. Look. Okay, so what do we do know about commutators? Let's see, if I have A, B, and uh, I'll group this thing up as a bundle, yeah, whatever. So this thing you might remember this if you do a lot of this commutator thing. I don't know if it's right, but it's 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 really not hard to show. So it's A B this thing, subtract uh, this thing times A B. And then it's the same trick of subtract a thing and then add this thing back. The plus. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's use my thing I just figured out. AB is just AB, which is good. And that thing is actually CD. And plus A, C, D, B. Okay, now I need a new thing, which is called uh, A, C, D. For some reason, that way I want an anti commutator because I impose the anti-commutator relationship, I was hoping it's useful somehow. Okay, let's check if that's right. A, C, D, minus C, D, A, and you get A, C, D, adding C, A, D, subtract C, A, D, C, Okay. Yeah, that's right. So I'm going to have to use that twice. Ugh. So I have a commutator, anti commutator B of C and a D minus C B of D. And then plus A with C, D minus C, A of D, B. Okay, I'm done. Ooh. So whatever that thing we want to be zero, we can use this commutator and anti-commutator relationship to express them in terms of anti-commutators, which we would have some knowledge. Like commutator, we have no idea what they are. The anti-commutator, we might have some idea. So, oh, oh isn't that nice? A, B, C, D, just still A, B, C, D. The only thing I need to do to modify this result is add a, a side to each of them and put a bar on A and a C, right? That's the only difference. There's A, B, C, D. That's A, B, C, D. And they all come with a side. It's just A and the, A and the C comes with a bar too. This is a very sloppy way of thing to do it, but I'll just put the bars here. And there's bars here. Bars here. Okay. Oh, I could copy this whole thing again, but it, <laughs> I don't think it, uh, there's so much point. The point is, now we have some anti commutator of the fields, and the anti commutator of the Dirac conjugate field, which we can happily take it as a, to be zero, 
That's our commutator relationship anyway. And it's really this thing, a Psi and a Psi bar is the dangerous one. So what is this? If I can somehow show that disappear, then whatever our observable will also will, will commute. Yeah? Seems legit. So the point of all this whole calculation is says causality, causality says we need to compute the commutator of Psi and Psi. Okay. So we have Psi X and the Psi bar one. This is gonna be a lot of All right, let's see where we are. Oh, no, sorry. I want to see my mode expansion. Hello, mode expansion. Yes, this one. All right. So this thing consists of two parts. I need to calculate the anti commutator of these two guys and this two guys, right? The rest disappear because candy commuting B and the C is not giving me anything. Okay, so the first part I have. Okay, first I'm going to do something sneaky, but it's true. I'll just erase all the dagger and change them into bars. Well, okay, not, not, not the operators, but these guys. They can just be part. Yeah? So now I have it. I just want to find the anti commutator of these two lines. And it's just the anti commutator of the first half and the anti commutator of the second. They, they are independent. I do this and then I do that. Okay, so. Except now they are not at the same point. So let's see. The first term gave me dvp dvq. Commutator b of b dagger of some sort. And then I have u u bar at a p at a q and i have e to the minus i x i no sorry they are promoted so that they depend on time now so i can just write it like that no i'm wrong because they are different this is minus i p x plus i q y okay why don't i do this otherwise it's crazy i'll change all the x into y because now we're doing a different calculation they're not at the same point we're trying to find the commutator at a different point yeah you agree this is what i get from first term just multiply the first half of that and then the other one gave me the same integral thing. And the commutator of C and the C dagger is C dagger and the C, but it's anti commutator, so who cares? Then we have V, V bar, and uh, e to the minus plus IPX minus IQ. So the anti-commutator, what will these guys do? Is it produce, it basically help us to do an integral and change all the Q to P. 
Yeah, because it produces exactly the same factor that it needs to, to be canceled out, and a third function that we can use them to do integrals. So, it, so basically, this exactly canceled out that. So basically, what it, the result is that something like u p u bar p. And now I can write at x minus y. And the other one is vp, v bar p, and it's e to the i p x minus y. OK. So now the problem is what's u, u bar, and the b, v bar. I'll do u u bar. So u u u is something like a I'll ignore the side, it's there. But I'll just show you what's u u bar. U is this thing. And u bar u dagger would be just this guy. And then when you bar it. It's just a gamma matrix. So this is U and a U dagger, and there is that. So this thing. Manage, remember gamma zero, its job is to flip things around. So we have this. And I can just multiply this out. The first term is m squared, which is, let me, m. The last term is also m. And there is the 1, 2 component, which is sigma dot p. And there is the 2, 1 component, which is sigma bar p. So I can write it back in terms of the gamma matrices, which is this. Okay. You might want to have uh, try to do it by yourself. So using this identity, so the first term is written by e mu gamma mu plus m acting on this thing. And the second term There's a minus sign. And it's something like this and this. So the minus sign is on the M. And now we'll do the cool trick of replacing P mu by i partial x. If I do the derivative on x, it will bring down a minus i p, and with that i, it will be p. And then in this case, I have to replace this by a minus i partial x, because this guy, the x, is different. So this p mu can be thought of as a minus i partial x on it. Yeah, now I have all this minus signs. I can take it out. So the final result is i partial x plus m, which get pulled out in front. And then this is e to the i minus i p x minus y minus e to the minus i p y minus x.
The question is, do you remember what's this? The propagator, the scalar propagator. And so this is the thing called, I think in dense notes it's called dx minus y. And the other parts is called dy minus x. And he shows that this thing indeed zero at a space-like separation. Because at a space-like separation, we can choose t equals zero. So those are actually three vectors. But if you look at the structure of this two integral, changing, changing, if they were space vectors, then you can just change your momentum to be integrated instead of p, but the minus p. So, since whatever this, there is operator outside, who cares? But it's acting on zero, outside the entire light hole. Right. Yeah, the same problem. Should the derivative in front of be slashed? Please, we are, where did my gamma mu go? Yeah, yeah, that's the question. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. My income may disappear. Second question, maybe? Yes. Um, instead of introducing a derivative, couldn't we just set p goes to minus p? Or is there anything that is not allowing us to do that? Oh, you might be able to do that. I just... Second term, you could just say p goes to minus p, so the expression I, uh, this? Yeah. You say set p equals minus p. No, no, no. In the second term, in the integral, you can make a change of variable. Whoa, whoa. Change the integral. In, in this term? Exactly. Okay, set uh, p, three, three vector p to be minus p. Exactly. To change the integral. Exactly. And you would have the same exponential and then a minus sign, the same thing, basically. Hmm. Interesting. So, oh, you, 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 you are definitely taking time to be equal. P to be like an equal, right? If you want to. Yeah. But yeah, because it's space like separated. You might be right. I, I need to check. Yeah. We can just, if they're space-like and we can just set the time to be equal, don't we know that this thing vanishes because that's the anti-commutation relation to be opposed in the first place? Ah, oh, that's a, that's a definitely a much quicker way to, well, there is a gamma zero, I don't know if it matters. We impose the Poseidon Poseidon Dagger standing commutator. Gamma zero, should... gamma zero, like when you switch it, it will jump into the middle of. But you, you might be right. You can track the spinner indices, like you could track the spinner multiplication with the indices and then everything. And then get rid of gamma zero. Yeah, that, that's that that's possibly going to work. But now we have a propagate. So, so yes, I think by causality reasons, we can take a different shortcuts, which I need to check that they all work. They are probably do because they gave the right result. But let me check that you can take the different P and then you can, you can just directly look at the anti-commutator relationship. They, they are all excellent proposals. And I think they're gonna work. But the idea is now we have a Fermi propagation. So, uh, next week, we'll just look at the Feynman propagator and we'll finally be ready to start to interact. And I think that's the only thing left to do is to look at the Feynman propagator, then we'll start interacting in theory. And then you will see the formula you love so much, right? The LSD reduction. <laughs>